Good morning and welcome to the Battles Within. Today we're starting our, we're in uh, session number 111. 111. Man, that's a long time. And we still have a long ways to go before we finish the studying uh, the life of who is Jesus. You know, but that's what it's all about, isn't it? Um, I could finish this series and start all over again. and It would take us years and years to go through this. And there's just so much information. I hope to put all this information into a book when I'm done. And then you'll have a big giant, uh, one of those almost like, look like a, a Bible, uh, I mean, a family Bible with all this stuff in it. Uh, outline format. But anyway, today if you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, we'll be looking at verses 24, I mean, 25 through 34. Uh, let's go ahead and oh, let's let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity we have that we can study your word. I thank you, Lord, for who you are. Help us, Lord, to better understand it so we can share your truth with others. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. John chapter 7, beginning in verse 25, says, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye, not, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto him, Yet a little while I am with you. Then I go unto him and him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And whether I am, thither, thither ye, shall not, ye cannot come. So today we're going to be looking at the um, um, we're going to look at uh, the that there were some people who had believers now in Jesus, and there was conflict being risen between Jesus and the Jewish leaders, and this was kind of being demonstrated in front of these group of kind of uh, non-involved parties to not understand what's going on. Let's look at verse twenty-five. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? Now, you know, while this discourse was going on between Jesus and the crowd, uh, another group appears in this story. And uh, some of this group were, that were gathered uh, perhaps uh, outside or near the doorway, uh, possibly from Jerusalem to hear and confront Jesus and uh, spent some time in Jerusalem and knew of the hatred and the Jewish leaders towards Jesus. And so they knew of this conflict there between them. And they said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? Now these knew more of the design of the Sanhedrin than the others that were spoken of before that we talked about last week. These people here knew the design of, was them that this was he whom they seek to kill. And remember, they had accused Jesus of being demonic possessed and, and seeing that none wanted this good man killed, they, they hindered them from doing the execution of Jesus. Verse 26, But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? So said they they seem that they see that Jesus seemed to be free to say whatever he wants to, whatever he liked to say in the temple. He did openly and publicly. It was as if he had a license from the chief priest to do it. Because no one no one stopped him. It said they say nothing to him. So the Jewish leaders were not openly contradicting him. It appears that they never shut down his speaking in the temple or the streets. So these folks who spent much time in Jerusalem don't see where the Jewish religious leaders publicly forbid Jesus to speak. So Jesus continues his preaching ministry without their interference. So Jesus takes the liberty in charging the Jewish leaders with the intent to kill him. 
And on many occasions, uh, uh, Jesus on many occasions justified his actions by arguing against these leaders man-made practices. You know, these are, these are as we continue to talk, these were Sabbath day worshipers, or let's say Sabbathites, let's call them. Because they worshiped the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was the most prominent thing they could do. And Jesus did everything in his power to show the uh, ridiculousness of their false religion worshiping the day. That's why Jesus said the Sabbath day was made for man, not man for the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was made to give man a day of rest, to restore the man back to his, his position so he could enjoy the time away from his, his hard work that they had to do with their hands. And an opportunity to separate themselves from that to be able to focus on God. But it wasn't to lay all these burdens on you on the Sabbath day. That was not his intent at all. It's supposed to be a day of, of enjoyment, not a day of, of war. I mean, of, in the way, the work, work of religion. Anyway, he even stressed that these religious leaders judged in favor of men and not according to the truth of God's word. So they, the, the, the people that were there asked the question, do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ then? Because they're not defending, they're not rebuking him. They begin to wonder if the Jewish religious leaders had changed their minds concerning Jesus. Maybe they no longer want to kill him. Maybe they, they changed their mind. Maybe this is why they let him say whatever he liked led the people to wonder as a result of all his plain demonstrations and full proof, are the Jewish leaders themselves now convinced that this man himself is the Messiah that has been promised of long and old and long expected? Verse 27. How be it we know this man whence he is? When Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. It's kind of a strange statement here. Um, they say, uh, uh, how be it, which is but, even if their religious leaders accepted this man as the Messiah, uh, they said, we have reasons not to accept him, regardless of their thoughts. Uh, and they proceeded to state why, which is kind of a strange thought, but this is why we have to read the scriptures and understand what these people were thinking. Remember, we don't think in the times that they thought. They had their own religious thoughts and biases and and superstitions and things of that nature that we people have today too. Different people have different things today. As we see the end of the world coming, we know it's coming. We can see the signs. I mean, the the, the house is already painted, okay? We, we see it's ready to be occupied. Um, but we see here it says, uh, we know this man which he is. We know the place of his birth and residence. We know his mother and his father and his brothers, even there among us. We know him to have been a carpenter most of his life prior to his ministry. So, so we know a lot of things about this man. But then they said, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Now, it's kind of a strange comment for us, seeing that uh, the location of his birth was, was written of and, and, and seen in the reports of the chief priests and scribes to King Herod. In Matthew 2, 5, it says, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus is written by the prophets. So his location, his birth was always known. I mean, it should have been. This would have been a common expectation of the Jews that we know he was born in Bethlehem. But this belief appeared to be twisted after he was born. See, uh, so there again, this is their they're superstitious, how things get distorted. You ever play that little children's game where you, you say something in somebody's ear and it goes around the room and when he gets back, you try to say what it is. And it, it never comes out what, what it is. But it says after his birth, the Messiah, they believe that after the birth of Jesus, that the Messiah would be hidden or taken away in some mysterious manner and then suddenly would appear again in an unexpected location when he was fully grown. Uh, no one would know anything about what happened to the Messiah after his birth until he suddenly appeared on the world stage as the Messiah. Uh, Jesus attempted to correct this false superstition. We know in Matthew 24, he says in verse 23 through 26, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber. Believe it not. 
Jesus says, see, they believe this, that, that that's what's going to happen. I believe maybe that's what's going to happen with the Antichrist. Maybe the Antichrist is going to claim some uh, birth in uh, Bethlehem or something like that, and then, and then uh, suddenly pop on the world stage. There's a few extractions from Jewish writing that kind of shows that this was a common expectation. Uh, in their writing, it says, The Redeemer shall manifest himself and afterward be hid. So it was in the redemption from Egypt. Moses showed himself and then was hidden. They use an example from the Songs of Solomon that says, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. And they add this statement to the end of that. A roe appears when it, and then is hidden. So the Redeemer shall first appear and then be concealed, and then again be concealed, and then again appear. So the Redeemer shall first appear and then be hidden, and then at the end of 45 days shall reappear and shall cause manna to descend. Now see, that, that goes back to the idea that they were looking for something else. They wanted God, Jesus, to give them manna because they believed. They wanted to see you feed him food. He fed the 5,000. He didn't feed them manna. And so they came back asking for more. They wanted to see him to be the Messiah, the Redeemer that they expected here. So all this kind of blends together that if we as Gentiles don't think about those things, we don't know the religious beliefs, we don't understand that. But see, it makes sense here. All these things make sense. You got to deal, you got to peel that onion back a little further to get to it. But we see that's being done here in this Matthew, in this, in Matthew, in Luke, John chapter 7. So, and it is unsure how the Jews got this belief or opinion. I mean, uh, this does explain these verses, though. We don't know how they got it, but it also shows us that John was well acquainted with the opinion of the Jews, however improbable those opinions were. Now, remember, at this point in time, Jerusalem is gone. The point of writing of John is gone. John is the last book, the next to last book of the Bible that was written was written by John. John wrote the book, the Gospel of John, and then he wrote the, he recorded the gospel, the revelation of Jesus Christ as given to him. So we see these are the last two books. So the Gentiles were predominantly the, uh, uh, the, the most of the people in the Christian church at this time, near about 90 AD or something like that. So he's trying to give the, the readers an understanding of these things that were written. And this is what Jesus said. And this is what they said. Verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. The words cried means implied an elevation of the voice, answering to the intensity of the speaker's feelings. He had passion in his speech. But a lot of people say, I cry all the time because I have passion in what I say. So Jesus had passion when he said he taught in the temple. And it said, so he cried in the temple. Again, Jesus' feelings have been heightened by another entrance of their lack of understanding. I mean, he couldn't understand why he could understand that this was frustrating to Jesus. He's human. He's also God, but at this point, is humanity. They only think of the outward appearance and never seem to grasp the inner truth. Jesus was amazed two times, the Bible tells us. One time he was amazed at the belief of the Jared. He was amazed at his belief. And second time, the other time was he was amazed by the disbelief of the people in Nazareth, that not many works could be done there because of their disbelief. He's amazed twice. Here he is, we see that he's, he, you know, he is, he, it, it, it's, con, it's really confounding that these people would not understand. They only think of the outward appearance and never seem to grasp that inner truth. Jesus probably, with a loud and earnest voice, addressed the words which they had just spoken in the private manner to each other. They were whispering to each other, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says out loud what they were saying, addresses those problems. They couldn't imagine that Jesus heard them as he was in the temple at some distance from them, but he knew what they said. He said, you both know me and know whence I am. He turns to them, knowing their accusations, and asks them, do you know both me and where I came from? So he contradicts them in the same breath as much as he tells the people that they don't know the one who sent him. They may know some things about him, but they don't know the one who sent him. They did not know the father. They knew Joseph, but not God. 
when they said we know whence this man is, uh, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? That came from John chapter 6. Jesus plainly tells them that they did not know his father and consequently could not tell where he came from. He says, I am not come to myself, but he that sent me. He says, I'm not here today on my own behalf. I, I came because the father sent me. Uh, he gave a proof daily through his miracles and his messages that he preached that God had sent him. And then he said, whom you know not. It's clear you could not recognize someone sent from God because you don't know him yourself. Uh, people who are lost that are in churches today can sit under false doctrine. But people who are saved today, who the Holy Spirit's working in, cannot sit under false doctrine because their hearts become hardened, because it, it pricks their hearts. John chapter 7, verse 29. But I know him, for I am of him. He has sent me. Jesus said, you don't know him, but I know him. I know the Father's nature and his perfections, his purposes and his promises, his counsel and his covenants, his mind and his will. I know him. No one else knows the Father but Jesus and those whom the Father pleases to reveal himself to. You know, God reveals himself to us how? Through his word, through reading his word. But if you don't read it through the power of the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the truth, you still don't know him. He said, for I am from him. Good reason why Jesus should have intimate and perfect knowledge of God, because he says, I am from him. He is part of him. He is God. He's not only begotten of the Father, he knows him wholeheartedly, understands him because he knows what the Father knows. They're one. He says, he has sent me. Jesus was personally sent by the Father to redeem his people. This is the original purpose of Jesus. The Jews did not know this. They pretended to, but they really did not know his purpose. His purpose was to save the lost. So then they sought to take him, but no man laid hand on him because his hour was not yet come. So then the rulers, it wasn't the people, by the way, it was the rulers that sought him. The rulers and their friends, they, they want to take him by force and carry him to the Sanhedrin. They want to try and condemn him for being a blasphemer. To call to them, they became enraged by hearing him claim he was directly from God. Jesus, whom they took to be a mere man, the son of Joseph the carpenter. They also sought to take him because Jesus rebuffed them, because Jesus professed to be the Messiah. But it says here that no man lays hand on him. They wanted to do it badly, but they had no power. They were restrained by the secret providence of God prohibiting it. They were awed by the majesty of Jesus, which showed itself in the looks and words. He, they couldn't do it. They probably were afraid of the people even. If they laid hands on a righteous man, the people believed him to be at least a prophet. They could lose favor of the people. Their only power was that the people feared them, believed that they had the, the message of God. That's the problem we have today with a lot of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church and the Pope spewing blasphemy, by the way, you hear me? Blasphemy when he's talking about that the LBGT, LG, LGT, whatever, LGBTQ organization, that those, that, that that is okay, that that lifestyle is okay. That's not what the Word of God says. As we said last week, the, 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 the main bishop in, North, in the United States was fired by the Pope because the main bishop said, that's not what the Bible says. I'm not Catholic. But I'm telling you, I'm not Roman Catholic. Everybody's a part of the Catholic Church. Catholic Church is a universal church. But we're not Roman Catholics. But the deal is, and but the deal is, this man says that he's not preaching the word of God. He's destroying the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, because he's not teaching the truth. See, he says here that they, they that that these people were in awe. They were afraid of the people. If they laid hands on a righteous man, the people believed that they were at least a prophet. Some people couldn't even raise his finger. As a result, every man was fearful of being the first that should seize him. Therefore, no man did. Remember, the truth is not in the hands of man, but God. 
It's, revealed, it's ordered by divine providence that Jesus should not be apprehended by this thing. See, I was telling you before, I, I lost my thought there for a minute. But remember, the Pope only has power over men because men give them the ability to have the power. The power did not come from God. The power comes from man. How do we know? Because he's not preaching the truth of the gospel. He's not preaching the word of God. Therefore, he is using man's power. He's using man's influence. And if they lose that, they lose everything. This is what the problem with these people here, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders. If they lost their power over the people, uh, they'd be in trouble. So they were fearful of doing something that might lose favor. Uh, it said that they did not take him because his hour was not yet come. It was not yet Jesus' time to suffer and die and depart from this world. It was going to happen, but it wasn't the time. That time was fixed. Jesus coming into the world was the fulfillment of time. Nor could he die before that time. Galatians 4, 4 said, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. When the right moment comes, that when Jesus said, Whenever the right moment comes is when Jesus was going to die. Not then. It was not the time. No man can lay hands on him, whatever power he might have to try it. If there was time for every man's death, nor can any man die before that time. But Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 2 said, To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. The ancient Jews said the proper and appointed time for his death. The proper and appointed time for his death. You die when God says it's time. You don't die before God says it's time. Whether you believe that time is fixed and permanent or can be changed, I can see both ways. I believe the Bible says this appointed man wants to die and then the judgment. There is a time appointed. Can you do anything about it? I don't know. That's the debate because the Bible does say that if you're good to your mom and dad, your days will be long upon the earth. Uh, Hezekiah was set to be dead, set to die, and God gave him more time. So he said, your time's appointed. Get your house in order. He prayed, cried to the wall, and God gave him more time. So therefore, your time can be extended. It also says the days can be shortened. So... But there's a point in time, John 31, 731. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than this man which hath done? So while some of those among the crowd were displeased at Jesus' doctrines, we see others were convinced by his miracles to believe in him. If not the Messiah, certainly an extraordinary person. These were ordinary people, especially those that came out of the countryside that believed in him. The city Jews, above all the rulers, uh, uh, were very opposed to him. But the, the country people who heard Jesus preach and saw him do things, they were commoners, and they just believed. One can easily observe that faith in Christ and true religion spread and flourished among, most among those common sort of people. And said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? These ordinary people here are not referring to much uh, uh, to the miracles. Many of them might have seen done by him on other parts of Judea and Galilee. Not only those that he had done in proceeding at the feast, but probably referring to things that he did while he was there. That John did not even mention. Remember, John says in his book, more things are written than so many things I could mention in this book that the pages can't contain it all. But clearly he was doing miracles while he was there too. The Jews expected many miracles to be done by the Messiah when he came. And for good reason, as Isaiah 35, 4 through 6 says, Say to them that are of the fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a harp and the tongue of the dumb sing. Certainly this describes what happened with Jesus. Certainly Messiah's prophecy is being fulfilled in their eyes and they can see it themselves. Surely no one has done these things that this man has done. Who can we expect more out of? It's certain that the ancient Jews expected miracles in the day of the Messiah. Verse 32. And the Pharisees heard the people murmur such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So the, uh, uh, it said they heard, they heard whispers privately talking among themselves. 
that Jesus surely must have been the Messiah since he did such wonderful things. And they were concerned that their so-called religious leaders did not recognize him as the Messiah. They heard them murmuring about that. They were starting to think they were going to lose their power and their authority over the people. It seemed that the Pharisees and the chief priests overcame their fear because now they attempted to take Jesus to bring him before the Sanhedrin. They wanted to condemn him and put a stop to the people receiving him and believing him as the Messiah. Uh, their way of life about changing was about changing if they did not take action. They knew that they were soon going to have a, have a problem on their hand if they didn't take care of it now. Fearing their principles and practices would be rejected and their persons and authority be brought into contempt because they were against the Messiah. Then said Jesus unto him, Yet a little while I'm with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. So to the officers that were sent to take him, and the others believing, unbelieving Jews that were about him, he told them, he said, Yet a little while I am with you. Now Jesus would only be with them, uh, 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 would be only, only be with them no longer till the next Passover. That was it. About a half a year was all he had time left here at this point in time. This statement by Jesus could have several purposes. One, it could partly stress to the people the importance of this opportunity with him while he was still available. Today is the day of salvation, folks. Soon the world will end, and you're either on the right side or the wrong side. You're either accepting him, you've either bowed your knee to him in praise and glory, accepting him as the Messiah, or you bow your knees to him in shame, accept, uh, praising him as Messiah. You say, oh, aren't you both praising him as Messiah? Yes, one of them has been redeemed, and one of them has been lost. The Bible tells us that every knee should bow, every tongue should confess, and later on it says every knee shall bow, and every knee shall I mean every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. See, the one of them is that we should because he deserves it. And we're praising him today. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus has died for the on the cross for my sins and washed them all away, past, present, and future. It's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. See, I profess Jesus Christ. I praise Jesus Christ. But those of you out there that do not accept Jesus Christ today, you will one day bow on bended knee and profess him. You are Lord and Savior who we rejected. And God will cast you into ever-burning torment and hell. And I don't want that for anybody. I'm no better than you. What I've done, you can do. More than you can do. Could not stress the officers that they were sent to take him, that they were and their masters. They did not need to trouble themselves, for in a short time, Jesus said, he would soon be gone from them. Until that time, he would continue despite them. He said, Then I go unto him that sent me. Expressing his death was voluntary and signifying his glory and happiness after it. Verse 34. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. Where I am, thither ye cannot come. He said the Messiah, who he is, meant after his departure, the people will once again be in great distress. When Jesus left, we know when he departed, there was going to be great, Jerusalem got destroyed in 70 AD. Totally destroyed. They would once again diligently seek the coming of the Messiah. Once Jesus died on the cross, they would once again begin seeking for the Messiah. They would seek him as a redeemer and deliverer of them out of their troubles. And it says they would not find it. When this happens, no Messiah will appear. No Savior will be sent. No Redeemer will come to relieve them. They shall inquire and look for one in vain as they did before. Jesus said, where I am, thither ye cannot come. This whole clause is to be understood as future, meaning where I shall be, you will not be able to come. That is, he the Messiah would be in heaven. Though they would earnestly desire his presence to aid in the saving of the city and the nation from the Romans, yet they would not be able to obtain it. This does not refer to their individual salvation, 
Because it's not true of the individual sinner. If they seek Christ in a proper manner, they're always able to find him. So that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel will seek him, but will not be able to find him. They They saw his coming to deliver them, but he did not do it. Verse 35. And when the Jews said then, said the Jews among themselves, Whether will he go that he shall not find him? Will he go into the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? See, once again, the leaders responded, and Jesus spoke concerning his death and resurrection and ascension. The Jewish leaders didn't understand him again. They thought Jesus was threatening to leave them and go to the brethren of the dispersion, the lost tribes of Israel that and the foreign lands. This would be kind of sarcastic words, insinuating that he would go into foreign countries to address himself to the Jews there, who might not be supposed, might not, uh, who might be supposed not as well instructed. You know, they weren't as religiously knowledgeable as they were, and therefore they didn't live in Judea and Jerusalem, and they weren't in, involved in the daily life of, of following the the Sanhedrin and the the Jewish leaders, and therefore they might be easily susceptible to this false doctrine. And he might be able to make proselytes even among them. And then he not only from those people, it says, but also applying that he himself might find ignorant and stupid Gentiles who don't know anything about God that might believe. I'm one of those stupid and ignorant Gentiles. Okay? I'm one of those stupid and ignorant Gentiles that Jesus has spoken to and I accept him. I accepted him. I got my knowledge through him. Verse 36. What manner of this saying is this that he said? Ye shall seek me and not find me. Where I am, thither ye cannot come. Jesus' statements here were not easy to understand. If what Jesus said was not what he meant, which is suggested, what should he mean by saying, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Repeating the words of Christ just now expressed by him. These people did not understand him. Jesus clearly told who he was. He clearly demonstrated who he was. But the leaders did not accept him because he was not who they wanted him to be. Is Jesus who you want him to be today? He is who he is, the Savior of the world. He is calling you today to accept him. If you're a Christian today, he's calling you to live your life for him. Let me tell you, salvation is free, but Christianity costs you everything. Being a follower of Christ can cost you your life. Believe me, there's people today around the world that are dying because they profess to be Jesus Christ. We in America have it easy. And we're ashamed to tell our neighbors what they might think of us. Whereas people around the world are professing Jesus at gunpoint, the last thing they see is a bullet heading towards their head but they profess Jesus Christ anyway. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, today is the day. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we can come, that we can study your word, we can study who you are. Lord, we know you proclaimed who we are. We know, Lord, there's no excuse for not believing you who you are. I pray for these today that's in, the, in listening, that are watching this video today uh, and uh, on Facebook Live. Lord, I pray for them today. If they don't know you as their Savior, today be the day. Today be the day, Lord. Let them bend knees because they should, not because they will. I pray, Lord, for those that are Christians today, that they get out and share the gospel. Just tell people what Jesus did for you. That's all you got to do. You don't have to do anything special. Just say, hey, you know, I thought, well, let me, can I share my faith with you? You're my friend. Can I just share my faith with you? You're my acquaintance. Can I just share my faith with you? That Jesus saved me. Jesus made a difference in my life. He can make a difference in yours too. Can't you just do that? Lord, I pray right now you help them to understand that. I pray now, Lord, as we go into day, that wherever the gospel is preached, that have power to pierce the hearts of even the hardest sinner. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I thank you today for your time and your attention. And until next time, may God greatly bless you.